The Indiana Jones franchise now has a legacy which spans across the last 40 years of filmmaking, which makes it the perfect case study to analyze the shift from practical filmmaking to digital special effects. Because throughout those 40 years, the entire way that films are made has completely changed. So that's why we're going to explore the difference in special effects and filmmaking approach of both the original Indiana Jones trilogy and his more recent outings, breaking down some of the major effects from across the eras, and then using this to answer the age-old question, are practical effects better than CGI? And if we could do all of this stuff that looked better decades ago, then why are we leaving the amazing practical effects of the original Indiana Jones trilogy behind? Well, to answer these questions and more, grab your fedora as we analyze the evolution of Indiana Jones's visual effects. But before we do that, do you know who this is? Volvamos a este túmulo etrusco cerca de Tarquinia. This is Spanish Indiana Jones, and you could watch him if you download the sponsor of today's video, Atlas VPN. Because with Atlas VPN, you can easily access geoblock content from almost anywhere in the world. So if there's something you want to watch and you just can't find it streaming in your country, then you can easily use Atlas VPN to virtually change your location to a country where it is available and then just watch it as normal. Simple as that. And so right now, Atlas VPN is running the best VPN deal on the market, protecting unlimited devices for just $1.83 per month, plus three months extra. And all of this with a 30 day money back guarantee, which is just a ridiculously low, but limited time offer. So secure this offer now by using my link in the description. Bien, eso es todo por hoy. Ah yeah, good point Indy. Atlas VPN also protects your privacy by scrambling your IP address, which stops all those weirdos on the internet from tracking your activity and stealing your data. So to access Geolock content and protect your private information at the same time, grab Atlas VPN's big deal for just $1.83 per month, plus three months extra, using my link in the description before it expires. Anyway, now back to the video. So to begin our adventure, let's start by looking where the first Indiana Jones film ended, with possibly one of the best closing shots to a film of all time. A massive wide shot which pans up to reveal the vast, endless Hangar 51 the secret warehouse which stores the countless mysteries of the ancient world, all of which have been hidden away from the public. Now, this shot is a great piece of visual storytelling, as it shows that, despite the giant adventure we just went on with Indy, his contributions are just an insignificant drop in the ocean of thousands of different discoveries that we may never see. And it will be this shot which provides the baseline for all of our comparisons today. Because this shot is actually completely fake. They didn't at all film it in a giant warehouse, but instead they used old school filmmaking tricks to just make you think that they did. So why was this shot fake? Why not just film it in a real warehouse? And how did they even fake it to begin with? Well, to the filmmakers, this shot actually presented a pretty big problem as to have it have this impact of making Indy's adventure feel like that of a tiny fish in a massive pond. This scene was entirely dependent on both awe and on scale. The warehouse had to be absolutely huge because it had to completely dwarf Indy's crate. So to attain the maximum impact from this shot, the filmmakers needed to film it in a gigantic environment. But if you wanted to film this in real life, a massive open 1930s warehouse like this isn't just something you find lying around easily. And even if you were to find one, having to then fill up and light such a dense, wide and long shot would have been a monumentally expensive task to do. And so this meant that the shot had to be faked. And in 1981, the go-to way of doing any wide shot like this was to use a special effects technique known as matte painting. This was the process of combining real life footage with that of a painting, and then using those painted areas to extend, expand or enhance the original footage by literally hand painting in new areas and features to that shot. And so this was the perfect choice for Hangar 51, because by doing this, the only part of the set that they'd actually have to make in real life was the tiny little area in the center of the frame where things would actually have to move, and then the entire rest of the frame would be still and therefore could be completely painted in, giving them absolute freedom to extend the set as far and as wide as they wanted to. But of course, for all of these benefits, Creating a matte painting was no easy feat. In fact, all the way back in 1981, the process of making a matte painting was a very complicated and skillful task. 
To create one, you would have to set up a glass plane between what you wanted to film and the camera. So now the camera is filming through the glass plane. And it's on the glass plane that you paint in everything extra that you wanted in the shot. But you leave holes where you want the actual footage to be. So this way the camera could capture the real footage through the holes in the glass and the rest of the shot would be the painting in the foreground. So in our case, Michael Panglazio, the artist behind this now famous shot, painted in the warehouse across the entirety of the glass, except for one tiny hole which he left in the middle of the frame. And it was through this hole that the camera was able to film the man wheeling the arc away. And so, to make this illusion work, Pangrazio had to paint a seamless blend between the real footage and the painting, making sure that all the shapes and all the shadows all lined up exactly how they should be in a way where nothing stood out. So it's no surprise that this took him three months to do, because at the end of the day, it does look absolutely incredible. But as amazing as this shot looked, and as much as people love these old school practical effects, this technique is not without limitation. And this is perhaps one of the reasons why the door was left wide open for CGI to just come walking in. So what are these limitations? Well, firstly, matte paintings are really expensive and time consuming to make. Which is why there's only this map painting and a handful of other map paintings throughout the film. But beyond this, they have a much bigger problem. And that is that, by their very nature of being painted, without significant visual trickery, these backgrounds are completely static and unable to move. And so this not only puts a limit on what you can actually have as your map painting, for example, you can't have an ocean because it moves, but more importantly, it puts a hard limit on the type of camera moves you can actually use with a map painting. Because when a camera or a pair of eyes move around, they experience a thing called parallax. This is that phenomenon where the closer an object is to us, the faster they appear to move. And the further an object is away from us, the slower they appear to move. And an everyday example of this can be observed when you look outside the car window and all the stuff by the roadside moves super, super fast, but that one tree in the distance seems to barely move at all. And why this happens is very sciencey and complicated and to do with geometry and lines and stuff. But for our purposes here, it's important to know about. Because map paintings can't replicate this. Like we said, they are completely static, which means they're unable to react to the camera's movement and recreate this parallax phenomenon. And so this is why the camera movement in most matte painting shots is very basic, usually only ever being like a simple pan or a simple zoom. Because if the camera's movement was too extravagant, then it would expose the fact that this background is just a flat painting and it would break the entire illusion of depth to the audience. Because that's all this is, it's just an illusion. So if map paintings aren't without their limitations, then does modern filmmaking, with all of its fancy enhancements, propose a sufficient solution to this? Well, the answer is maybe. And this will become more clear as we progress through our next section. Because what makes this warehouse scene such an interesting case study for today's video is that this exact same location just so happened to be recreated 30 years later in 2008 for Indy's fourth adventure, the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. So with there being such a significant time gap between the previous film and this one, to help bridge the two eras, this film opens with Russian agents dragging a kidnapped Indiana Jones back to Hangar 51, this time in search of something potentially more powerful than even the Ark, aliens. However, this time around, we see far more of this warehouse than we ever did in the first movie. In fact, this time, not only are there whole scenes of dialogue within this warehouse, but there's also entire action sequences which show characters jumping and diving and fighting all within this giant, densely packed area. And so the only reason that all of this was now possible was because of the 30 years of filmmaking evolution that had progressed between these two films. Now, handcrafted matte paintings were out and digital filmmaking techniques were in. So what were these fancy techniques and how did they match up to their senile old counterparts? Well, I think this shot here provides the perfect example of the freedom that digital effects allows for. In the original footage, only the very entrance of the hangar was constructed and captured on film. But in the final version, the camera can pull back for miles, capturing the vast, mysterious scale of this warehouse, but only at the fraction of the budget required. 
because now the filmmakers were able to completely extend this set using only digital filmmaking techniques. With them, all the extra crates they could ever need could be easily constructed out of 3D geometry, and then placed wherever they wanted in this warehouse. And then, to add ambience on top of this, simulated particles and CG lights could be cinematically controlled to create a dusty and atmospheric vibe. And doing this, pretty quickly you can begin to build up the exact same aesthetics that we saw in the first movie. Except now, by using these new techniques, you can also have a significantly faster turnaround on these shots than you'd ever get with the matte paintings. Because matte paintings are kind of this one-use thing. Like we said earlier, everything you draw has to exactly line up with the particular shot that it's being drawn for. And this means you can never really reuse the same matte painting for two different shots. But for CGI, this isn't at all the case. Because CG objects are made up on all sides out of 3D geometry, they can be shown from any angle or any perspective of the camera. And this means that, once an asset is made, it can then be used again and again in any way that the filmmaker sees fit. So what do I mean by this? And how did it enable the filmmakers to have a much more fleshed out sequence within this warehouse? Well, technically, there's not much official documentation on this. So I can't say for 100% certain, but I can very confidently say from my own experiences working in the VFX industry, there's no way the artists went around building hundreds and hundreds of individual crates for these giant wide shots. Because in the digital world, there's no reason for this. What's much more likely is that the artists built a few variations of high resolution crates for the foreground crates, you know, the ones you might actually see up close. And then for the background, they just simply reused those same crates, repeating them thousands and thousands of times over and just adding subtle variations in rotation, size or detailing so that the audience will never be able to notice that it's the same model being used again and again. And so this can save you a tremendous amount of work because with just a few different models you can very quickly populate a shot that would have previously taken you months to hand paint. Now, of course, the job's not done yet. You still need to set up all the lights and all sorts of other details so that everything looks realistic. And this can also take months. But the benefit of CGI is that you can then reuse a lot of these details in every other shot in the sequence. Because unlike a map painting, the utility of CG assets is not limited to the one shot that they were made for. Instead, they can be used over and over again. And this versatility means that you can very quickly iterate through an entire sequence because the work from one shot can easily flow into the work of the next. And then, on top of all of these benefits, there's perhaps one even more important factor which CGI allows for. And that is that, because all of these objects are placed throughout 3D space in the shot, it means that they are able to respond to the camera's movement in a way which recreates parallax. So now, if you look at these endless shots of the warehouse, the objects in the foreground are able to move much faster than the objects in the background. And this naturally creates that sense of depth in the scene and allows for much more complicated, creative and freedom in the cinematography. But with all of these positive features, this of course inevitably brings us to the biggest problem with it. And that is that, sometimes it just isn't realistic enough. Because whilst you never once questioned the potential fake nature of the beautiful looking warehouse in Rage of the Lost Ark, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull was very heavily criticised for its overuse of CGI. And I can totally see how, particularly people who grew up in the golden age of practical effects, with all the impeccable movie magic of the original Indiana Jones trilogy, wouldn't be too happy walking into the latest instalment of the franchise and seeing nothing but overt CGI popping off the screen for the next two hours. And so Kingdom of the Crystal Skull is not the hill to die on when it comes to defending the quality of VFX. And in retrospect, it probably was one of the films that gave CGI the bad name that it has. But what's interesting is that this film did actually have some visual effects which, like the Raiders map paintings, were very hard to question the fake nature of. And with these certain effects, the film perhaps even suggests the antidote to the bad looking CGI problem. Because despite having such a heavy use of CGI, this film also dug back into Indiana Jones' past to do something very cool and very unexpected. He decided to use another staple special effect of the Indiana Jones franchise. It decided to use miniatures. 
So in the 1980s, miniatures were the essential tool to so many of the most iconic moments across the original three films. They were used for the ghosts who emerged from the Ark in Raiders, or they were used all over the place in the minecart chase in Temple of Doom, and they were even used for the amazing invisible bridge reveal in The Last Crusade. So what are miniatures? Well, they're essentially very small-scale models of real-sized objects, and they use force perspective and other trickery to make them look much larger in the final film. And the benefit of them is that their small scales give filmmakers the freedom to do things that would be otherwise impossible to do at their actual scale. So for example, the only way you could ever have a giant four-legged death robot would be if that robot was also really, really tiny. And so miniatures were kind of the back in the day approach to CGI and 3D models. And if matte paintings were more often used for the massive wide shots, then miniatures were used for the smaller, more intimate, complicated things, or things which would have to have moved. So yeah, these guys were an absolute standout special effect that really carried the franchise throughout the 80s. Because like matte paintings, they looked amazing most of the time. So if miniatures were so good, then why did we stop using them? And what does this have to do with Indiana Jones 4? Well, also like matte paintings, these guys too weren't without their downsides. Because whilst miniatures can be quite cheap to make, they're very hard to get right as it requires extreme precision and skill to create models that look believable on camera. And then beyond this, if you want to animate these models, they first have to be built in a way that even lets them move, and then after that they have to be animated meticulously, by hand, frame by frame, using stop motion techniques. And this isn't even their biggest problem. Often, due to their small scales, the hardest part of miniature work is actually filming them. A great example of this can be seen in the minecart chase in Temple of Doom, where the film camera they were using was actually too big to fit inside the miniature mineshaft, and this meant that the only way they could capture anything inside of the tunnels was to use a much smaller photography camera, one which could only take one photograph a second and not video. And so this meant that the entire chase had to be shot in slow motion, one photograph at a time, and then sped up to real time later. Which must have just been an absolute nightmare to figure out all the timings of a high speed chase for. So the point I'm trying to make here is that miniatures can be insanely versatile, but they also aren't without their drawbacks, which is beginning to become a pattern here. So where am I going with all of this? Well, like I said earlier, the use of miniatures on Indiana Jones 4 might provide the key to getting more convincing visual effects. Because of all of their appearances in the franchise, the last place you would ever expect to see any miniatures would be 30 years later in the CGI crammed fourth installment of the series, where the artists were tasked with making Doomtown. So towards the start of the film, Indy accidentally stumbles into, and then rather comically flies out of, a classic Red Scare era nuclear test site, right before the bomb is about to go off. And so for this nuclear explosion, the filmmakers wanted to capture the raw power of the nuclear bomb that people saw in those old test footages from the 1950s, and show the sheer unrelenting, unstoppable destruction that it yields across the landscape. And it was because of this unrelenting nature that the effect of a nuclear explosion lent itself surprisingly well to miniature work. Because with a normal explosion, the actual event happens, boom, and then the building collapses in on itself afterwards. And on a miniature scale, the timings of this can all be pretty hard to figure out and get looking good. But with a nuclear explosion, the sheer force of the shockwave just wipes the building away. And so this meant that, with a few correctly primed miniature buildings and lots and lots of massive air cannons, you could very believably recreate this nuclear explosion. And so they had their special effects team go about and very delicately build two identical miniature versions of Doomtown. One each that they could use respectively for the two shots of the town's destruction. So they built everything in the town in miniature form, from the houses to the mailboxes. And to make them fall apart believably, they built things like the buildings the same way that they'd be built in real life, giving them a little stick frame interior that was coated with like studs and milled slidings and all sorts. Next, they primed these buildings for the explosion by pre-cutting them to fall apart in the correct way, and then filled them with little pre-burnt objects like shelves and furniture, in addition to tons of dirt and debris that they would fling out during the explosion. 
And so once everything was primed and ready, they set up 15 100 gallon air cannons that were meticulously timed to fire one after another to achieve the effect of the explosion progressing its way down the street. But before they could pull the trigger, like with all practical effects, there were some pretty big complications that they had to figure out first. To begin with, you may recall that I said earlier that they had to build two Doomtown sets for the practical explosion, because they wanted to capture two different explosions from two different angles. And so this immediately highlights a pretty big problem with doing explosions like this practically, because you can only blow up one set once, and if that explosion goes wrong or just doesn't look good, then you've lost your entire set and have to start all over again. And what made this problem particularly tense on Kingdom of the Crystal Skull is that they also had to film their miniature under exactly the right lighting conditions for it to be consistent with the live action shots of the film. So it had to be shot outside on a sunny day with no cloud coverage and in a way where the explosion would be backlit. And so all of this meant that the only opportunity the artist would have to do this entire one shot, one chance special effect was a 10 minute spontaneous window where the clouds parted and the weather was perfect. So I can't even imagine the stress of doing this because if it goes wrong or the weather suddenly changes, then you are completely screwed and have to start all over again. But luckily, in the end, when they finally pulled that trigger and the cannons fired, everything worked perfectly and the cannons completely decimated anything in their path, creating probably one of the most believable destruction effects I've ever seen. From the macro to the micro details, this destruction is just beautiful and is something very, very hard to get perfect in the CG world. However, visually, Despite how good it looked, there were a few drawbacks to doing this with miniatures, which were no easy task to solve in real life. Because to decimate miniatures like this required a tremendous amount of energy from the air cannons. And in the practical setup, most of this energy was being directed down the centre of the street. And this meant that, on the outskirts of the town, the damage being dealt there was lagging behind what the centre was receiving. And this just wouldn't be the case when it came to the raw omnidirectional power of a nuclear blast. And so this is where CGI came into play. The VFX artists were able to take a 3D scan of this little miniature town, load it into the computer, and then run their own destruction simulation over this town, leveraging the controllability and the versatility of CGI to blow up the town in a similar fashion to the practical one. And then all they had to do was blend the CGI into the practical. And this marriage of the two allowed for the best of both worlds. Because front and centre, there was the impeccable practical effects, and then blended into the background, the potentially less convincing, but still necessary CGI could be concealed. And this wasn't even the end of the VFX artist's contributions. They also digitally extended the edges of the town well beyond that of the miniature, which saved the practical artists from having to build an insanely big miniature. And then on top of this, they added a bunch of finishing touches that would have been super hard to figure out in real life. Like the initial shockwave from the blast, the one you see that kicks up all the dust in the town right before the primary shockwave comes in and reduces it to rubble, in addition to little things like heat distortion, more smoke, or just all sorts of other tiny little effects. And so in the end, the point I'm trying to make is that to get this beautiful, high quality, impactful effect, both practical effects and digital effects played a massive role in its creation, each one supporting the other and patching the holes which the other one had. And so this brings me to the suggestion that I made earlier, that this blend of the two could potentially be the antidote to the bad CGI problem. Because as has been frequently highlighted throughout this video, no single technique is without its flaws. Whether it's CGI or map paintings or miniatures or some other kind of effect, each one has a limitation in some way. And to only use one of these effects over all of the rest is just simply tying one hand behind your back. Now, I'm not trying to say that it should always be practical effects in the foreground and CGI in the background, but what I am trying to say is that practical effects should not be forgotten about, as we've had decades of amazing films that absolutely prove their worth. And the more ways that filmmakers can find to blend practical effects into their projects, the more ways everyone benefits. But at the same time, CGI shouldn't just be steamrolled under the weight of 
but practical effects look better because it too provides an invaluable addition to any filmmaker's toolkit and it brings a level of creative freedom to projects where it would be otherwise impossible to do so. Because that's the true brilliance of CGI. Not only does it allow for aliens and monsters and all this crazy high budget impossible stuff, but it also unlocks the door to the lower end of the financial spectrum. If CGI wasn't so cheap and easy to make, then so many films and TV shows would have never have gotten made. Stuff like Dread or District 9, trying to do those films practically would have either blown their budget completely out of the water or just ended up looking like some old school Doctor Who episode, which, yeah, no one, no one really wants. But on the other hand, if it's a top tier film with a massive budget that's capable of accounting for all the little problems we saw with Doomtown, then they should absolutely be considering this stuff more often, especially if they know that their CGI might not be up to scratch for what they need. Because if the Indiana Jones franchise has taught us anything, it's that both of these effects have their place. And with this, it leaves us looking to Indy's final evolution, with 2023's The Dial of Destiny, and seeing what VFX advancements and lessons have occurred in the last decade and a half since The Crystal Skull, and seeing how that affects the film's visual quality. The director has come out and said that the film's used a lot of practical effects, but you never know if that's just marketing to get old fans back in the cinema. But what do you guys think? Should visual quality overall utility every time? And is CGI just making filmmakers lazy? Or are people just using it wrong? Maybe The Dial of Destiny, with all its brand new developments, could finally help us answer this question. But until then, thank you so much for watching, and I really hope you enjoyed this video. Please leave a like and your comments and the thoughts below. And I also really wanted to give a massive thanks for all the support on the whole nerdstalgic plagiarism issue. If you didn't see, they've now taken down their video. So I just wanted to say a massive thank you for all the message of support and advice and guidance. It's been really overwhelmingly wonderful, so thank you very much. I'm sadly not able to reply to all of them, but I do genuinely read all of them, and they have guided my decision-making process and all sorts of else behind the scenes. So thank you so much, and have a great day. <laughs>